Okay, um, so uh, hello. Um, so I've started the class session here. Um, we've got a few people joined remotely. Um, so my plan was probably to talk about assignment two and then also to talk about um, the materials for this week. Uh, but as usual, you know, hopefully see if everybody has questions, wants to ask about particular things. Um, so this is an important week. So I did, I did want to talk a little bit about the, the materials, about the logistic regression and stuff. So, um, okay. So uh, I, I, I haven't quite gotten the assignment twos back yet. Um, I'm still working on those. I, I, I usually like to try to get them um, uh, done before before we do the class on Mondays here, um, if I make them do on Sundays, but I might not be able to do that. I got quite a few people uh, in the class here. Uh, but I did post um, the example solution um, already for the assignment two. So if you're watching this or watching this after the fact, uh, you can get the assignment two um, uh, example solution that I'm gonna go over here right now. Um, from D2L, um, even if I haven't gotten your feedback yet to you for the second assignment. So, um, so let me go ahead and start up my um, box here. Kind of remind you all kind of the, the steps if you're using the dev box that I gave you to set up. So if you change into your repository directory, to be able to do a vagrant up to um, start up the uh, virtual machine um, with the Jupyter Hub running inside of it and, and all the toolboxes installed. Um, I still had one or two people on Sunday asking about the scikit-learn. Um, so um, uh, hopefully now everything that we need for the class will be installed after you got the scikit-learn and got past the assignment too. So. Um, but I don't think there should be any additional libraries, but, um, but yeah, when you start up using the vagrant up in particular, look that you've got the port 8,000 being forwarded for this class. Um, and yeah, to submit your assignments, uh, you do need to have the, um, the, the shared folders mounted. So you need to see something like, uh, that your guest editions are okay. And that, uh, you, you have your shared folders being mounted from, whatever your repository is on your host machine to a directory called slash vagrant. Um, this is actually on the virtual machine. So, um, so anyway, that should allow you to go to the 127.0.0.1, which is your local host IP address, colon 8,000, um, report 8,000, then your Jupyter Hub should be there uh, up waiting for you to um, access it. So shut all these down, get back to a clean state here. Um, all right. So yeah, I think I'm gonna go over the assignment two first. Um, uh, just say a few things about it, see if, if people have any questions about it. Um, and then um, and then we'll go on to other stuff here. Um, so as I just you know uh, mentioned, hopefully I mentioned, um, you know this is the same one that I just posted here. Uh, the some example solutions for the assignment two here. Let me go ahead and, and uh, make certain everything reruns from start to finish. So, kind of as a reminder, hopefully I haven't looked at everybody's assignment two, but um, you know one of the last things you should do before you submit your assignment is is rerun, um, restart the kernel, and rerun all the cells to make certain everything runs cleanly from top to bottom. That's just a convention of people that work in cell based. Um, uh, notebook types of um, environment, IDE environments like this, you know, so, so normally you want to read this like a book, which means that, you know, you want to start with the first cell, cell for, first um, bit of text in the first cell and go from the top to the bottom, basically. So, so the cell should be designed to run in the order and in, in the sequence that you um, create them in your notebook. So. Um, So 
So um, the first part was to do a linear regression. And you know, one, th one thing about this, this first, this, the second assignment, um, there is quite a few things and you know, I maybe need to go back and tweak this assignment a bit, but, but there's quite a few things that we really haven't quite got to yet. So there's a lot of details of this um, um, that we, that you saw in the second assignment here that won't make as much sense until after like this week and next week uh, when we get into some of the details of linear regression and, and, and logistic regression. So the next two or three weeks, we're looking at linear regression and logistic regression. So um, um, I, I'll, I'll probably be talking a little bit about this um, today here. So, so linear regression, if, if you loaded the data, using the, the pandas library, um, you should have been able to plot it out relatively easily. I mean, you could have used just regular matplotlib to plot out the data, um, or you could have used Seaborn or um, other things. So you should have got a plot something like this, just of the raw data. But you always wanna use a scatter plot for data that, that's data points, um, especially like when you're plotting a, um, a dependent variable versus an independent variable here. So those, those are, terms from statistics, right? So, so the, the um, independent variable, uh, and, and again, more than one of these, but, but the independent variable is the things that you measure of, of which something depends, that's the dependent variable. So something depends on that, that you wanna try and model, um, or in this case, like fitting a, a, a linear regression model, we're, we're trying to fit basically a, a linear or a line to the data that, that, that helps explain or kind of predict the data, predicts the relationship between, in this case, between the, the population size and the amount of profits, okay? And, and a linear fit um, is not too bad of a, um, of a um, approximation here. I mean, in general, it looks like, uh, you know, as, as population increases, the profit increases in a relatively linear away. So, so, you know, and we'll talk more about this, I think, starting this week, you know, so the, the reason why I say it looks kind of linear, so I don't see something like uh, where it's kind of big at one end, it goes down and goes back up. Um, so if you have something that, that's curvy, or that seems to be curvy in the relationship between your um, independent and dependent variable, um, then it's probably, a, then it could be a nonlinear relationship, or it could be even more complex. So you have wiggles, you know, so it goes up and down and up and down, uh, things like that. But so, so anyway, I mean, there, there's definitely noise, but but it does, in general, seem to increase. The, so the profit increases as the population increases from left to right, right? So I'm saying in this case, it's maybe not um, bad to assume or to try a linear fit and see how well that works as a model, all right? Um, so again, if you have questions, uh, shout them out or put them out on the chat while I'm doing things here. Although with my one screen, I sometimes have trouble seeing when people put something in the chat. So you, I mean, you can also unmute um, if you're following along live here and, and, and to get my attention, so. Um, oh, and, and yeah, I did ask to, um, Oh, in the example solution, I gave, I gave an example of actually using um, Seaborn, uh, Seaborn's um, LM plot actually plots a linear model, which is basically a linear regression here. So we're, we're actually gonna be calculating this same fit here that the LM plot calculates uh, and plots the fitted line for you. But uh, just another example of, of plotting the data using Seaborn. Of course, you don't have to use Ellen plot, so you can use Seaborn to just do a scatter plot and get basically the same plot that you get with matplotlib there. Um, all right, so uh, we'll talk more today about the, the R squared score um, 
and, and some of these other things here. But you know, um, if, if you're using scikit-learn, uh, it follows the basic uh, framework for you know training a model um, and then using that model to, to do things with it. So you know, um, for this part of the first question, for the second assignment, um, you can simply use you know. So this creates an instance of a linear regression model from scikit-learn. You know where we imported. Um, uh, that um, object, that class from scikit-learn's linear model uh, library into our namespace. And so we've got, so we can directly instantiate um, an instance of a linear regression object. We can fit it to our data, right? So in this case, uh, we've got a single um, Verbal X, and, and you would have had to pull these out. So if, if you if you loaded these using pandas, um, you would have somehow had had to extract these, or at least you know, so extract the one column which represents the uh, population size in this case, and and, it, um, um, and in this case I called it X, uh, kind of by convention, and extracted the other column. So there's lots of ways you could have done this. So for example, if I didn't I'm sure we mentioned this in the, um, the the lecture materials for you know using the pandas library, but you can actually um, also you know um, access columns by name, and then those columns themselves are um, objects, um, um, so they actually um, are um, um, sequences and things. So they will also have things like so. so for example, we can access the values of of the population column that will actually access it as a NumPy array. So extract out that one column as a NumPy array. Um, and we assign that to X as a view. But yeah, there's, there's lots of ways though you can extract in your, your inputs and, and your outputs, the, the labels. And then in this case, um, as we talked a little bit about last week, you know, the labels are real valued numbers, which is why the, is what makes this a regression problem here, right? So we're not trying to, to uh, predict um, a category, you know, like true false or like for a binary classification, we're, we're trying to predict um, a profit, which can be any number between zero dollars or, or actually, I guess you can have negative profits um, in some of the data here. So you can actually lose some money. Um, up to you know um, twenty five thousand k um, for the best the most profits in this data set here. Um, so. So these things were kind of shown to you um, on the uh, example notebook from last week, right? So I'm just asking, I was just asking you to, to do them yourselves on this data set. So once you fit the model, um, you can ask for the score. This basically gives you that R, the R squared uh, score, right? So, so the score is the R squared. This, this is a measurement of how well this linear model, uh, which we're gonna plot later on, or which we have an example of a plot here. It's a measure of how well it, it fits the data, all right? Um, so if I had if I had an R squared score of one, that would mean that the line went exactly through the center of every data point, right? And if it, and you can have an R square, you know, R squares can range from zero to one. If, if you have an R squared of zero, it means that the line that the that, that the model um, had no explanation, ex, ex, no, no ability to explain the data. Okay, so um, it, it was it was uh, no um, explanatory power um, um, uh, to, to figure out a relationship between the independent and the dependent variable here. Right, or another way of saying that. So if you have an R squared of zero, it doesn't appear that there's any linear relationship. So in that case, it could just be that the, the data is completely noisy and there's no relationship, or it could be that there's a nonlinear relationship that the um, uh, that, that a linear model, a line, doesn't um, um, explain at all or very well, right? Likewise, you know, if you have nonlinear data, you can still get some R-squared score, 
but, but a low R squared score could be an indication that the data is very noisy, or it could be an indication that you have some nonlinearity in the data. So a linear model isn't a very good um, model of the data. Um, um, and and what, what's a high R squared score versus what's a low R, R squared score? Um, it's, it's a little bit subjective, but it'll depend on the data and the context here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, given how much kind of variation that we saw on the scatter plot, um, that's not too bad of, of a fit, um, a 0.7 R squared scoring or something. Um, and I also ask you to just to take extract from the model the the slope and the intercept. Um, um, so uh, are, are the, the those are called the in in scikit learn that's called the coefficient and the intercept. The inter, there'll always only be one intercept. Uh, another name for this is the bias term. And all of these that I'm kind of throwing out here will make more sense um, after this week and the next two or three weeks, right? Um, and then the coefficient, you'll have one coefficient for every um, um, independent variable, okay? So in this case, we only have one independent variable, but you can have more than one. So you could be trying to fit a, a model to multiple inputs, right? So in that case, if I had two, like, like if I had data about the population size and let's say the um, average income might be something that would be a good predictor of what profits I could make with a, a restaurant or a food truck, right? So if I had two um, independent variables, um, I would have two um, um, coefficients in my model, one for each of the independent variables that I'm trying to fit a model to, right? Um, and uh, likewise, you know, we're going to get into the details of this, um, and I should try and uh, make certain that I don't spend too long here talking about the assignment. Uh, but but this is getting in also to our materials for this uh, this week and in the next couple of weeks. So this really represents, um, you know, kind of as I um, as I implied here in the uh, example solution. This represents the, the slope. Um, and, and this represents the intercept of the line that we fit here. So, so the slope of 1.19 means that for every increase in population of, of one, right, where the population is probably, again, in uh, tens of thousands of people or something like that. I, I can't remember yet. So I think I, I think I said it in the setup for this. Um, um, but since we had the... Um, population measured in tens of thousands of people, um, a, uh, a slope of one for our 1.19 for our line here means that for every increase of one or, or 10,000 uh, population here, so from five to six, the, the, the line, the slope of the line was 1.19. So that means that the uh, profit increases by 1.19 um, units uh, for every one increase um, in, in our, population here, right? Or in other words, you know, so, so uh, again, since profit is measured in thousands of dollars, um, uh, we have an increase in profits of $1,190 um, for every increase of a population of one or, or 10,000, since, since we're measuring in 10,000. So, so the slope is important to understand. That, that's giving you the linear relationship. But the other thing you need if you're fitting a line to um, on some points, or the, the things you need to describe a line, you need a slope, but but the, uh, a line with that slope, there, there's an infinite number of lines with that same slope, 1.19 positive slope. So I, so I could I could just shift this 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 line up um, and 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 draw another line right here with the same slope, right? But it would have a different intercept. Okay, so that that's where the other term, the bias or the intercept. Term comes in. So this specifies um, if I had drawn out this um, um, this figure, uh, if we'd extended it down to where uh, our population was zero, um, this line would cross um, the, uh, the the y-axis when, when x is zero or when population is zero um, at um, 
an intercept of negative 3.895 here, right? So, the, so that's what the, the intercept term means here, or the, the um, um, but yeah, the scikit learn calls that the intercept, um, which makes sense in this case. And we'll also refer to that as the bias. I think I've already said. So. Um, so again, there's lots of ways you could have successfully plotted the um, fitted line to your data. So as I, I am going to be looking for that you pretty much redo the scatter plot, but, but you at least have one instance where you also plot the fitted line. Um, hopefully you got the fit correct. Um, so I'll be looking for exactly this figure with, with the line um, uh, imposed on top of the scatter plot of the, the data points here, right? Um, so using scikit-learn, uh, we can ask for the predictions on X um, to get our hypothesis. Um, and what that will do, it basically, uh, we're using the same inputs that we use to fit the model with, but this will give the prediction for every point, for every one of the um, um, uh, input X's that we have, okay? So, so basically like for this point here, uh, this is the input X where we had a population of, let's call it 12 point, or let's call it 13. So, so a population size of 13,000 in the city or area or whatever. Um, and, and the actual profits was, looks like around uh, $10,000, but our prediction is gonna be a little bit above that, right on the line, right? So, so when, you, when you do the, uh, the, the predict on X, it'll give you what, what the actual um, predicted value is for that uh, input, uh, for that population size in this model here, right? And of course, if you, if you plot all of those, so here to, to, to recreate the scatter plot with the line, the fitted line on top of it, we just we, we first plot our XY data. Um, so in this case, we're showing using matplotlib. Um, and then on the same plot, we plot a line where the X is the inputs um, and our Y comes from the predictions instead of the, the, the true Y. So it comes from our predicted Y. So they hypothesized uh, Y's from using the predict method from our um, fitted um, scikit-learn model here, linear regression model. All right. Um, so I can't remember. I think that's all I asked you to do on the um, uh, the first question here. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about the stuff so far. Let me check what I gave. Yeah, that, that was basically it. So, um, um, so I discussed a little bit uh, in here. Um, you know, I don't know why. I don't know if other people are having the same issue. I, I would expect people are having the same issue um, when you do the the rerun all the cells sometimes even though it, it does rerun them all it doesn't give the output sometimes so, so since you all should be using if you're using the dev box that i gave you or using the same versions you probably see the same things as well sometimes so i, I just have to it seems it seems if you re rerun all the cells but you have the uh, notebook scroll down to where you can see the outputs um usually it will do all the outputs even the, the ones that misses sometimes for that so. um We'll talk a lot more about um, splitting your data into training and test sets. Um, uh, we'll have like a whole a week kind of um, talking in more detail about why we need to do that. Um, but but uh, in the example solution, I, I, I talked a little bit about that. So 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 normally for for for, for statistics, uh, often if people do statistical analysis on a set of data. Um, 
often you have just a limited number of data points and you'll just fit a model to all the data and then you'll use like R squared and do other things um, to uh, get some feel for how well that model might be as, as a fit for the data. Uh, but in machine learning, we're often doing stuff with large amounts of data, so, so big data. Um, and in that case, it's better to um, actually figure out how good your model is um, as a predictor of the data by um, uh, training it on some data and then testing it on a different set of data that you didn't train your model with. Okay? So that in a nutshell is kind of what the purpose is of, of splitting your data into training and test data. So, um, So anyway, um, um, I'll let you read that. And uh, notice that uh, we actually um, um, increased the um, um, the R squared score. The R squared score is also the same as the um, the sum of the differences, which is another thing that um, once you get into the materials for this week, we begin talking about the linear regression here. So. Um, um, so again, this, this is a measure of, of how much, and, and I'll talk about this more later, this is a measure of, of how much uh, error there is between the, the line that was fit to this data um, and the data itself. Or in this case, in the second one here, this is the difference between the model um, oh, and, and the training data, um, but, um, um, and, and, but we can do run the same, get the same R squared score. Uh, but do it just on the held back test data. So you'll notice that um, 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 performance does decrease, which is you know, uh, an indicator that um, uh, there could be some issues, right? So, so when, you see, when you see your performance, your, your, your prediction scores decrease significantly um, on the test data um, after you train a model compared to your um, prediction scores on, uh, on the training data when you fit your model. Um, it could be that we had some issues with some overfitting or some other things. Um, that may or may not be significant. Um, so anyway. Um, all right, and then the second part, uh, again, you know, this was to, to, to um, um, do basically kind of what we showed you in the lecture notebook uh, where we did stuff with the stats model library um, last week, uh, but do it yourself on the data that you were given here. So, um, so you may or may not have had to reload the data, but I just reloaded it here. Um, so, so stats model is, is a different library, has, has a few differences in terms of the API, uh, has, has some of the, the, the same kind of overall um, um, feel to it, you know, so, so you, you basically create a, um, uh, an instance of an object. So in this case, I actually create an instance of an object and I fit the object all in one step instead of doing it in two different steps. Um, but um, oh, uh, but um, um, instead of passing the inputs and the outputs for the fit function, um, you pass them in when you create your instance of your object, and then you fit the model afterwards. So that makes sense for people for doing kind of more of statistic background. Um, oh, and and you also give the um, the, the labels first or or the um, the um, independent. Sorry, the, the dependent variable values first, and then your independent variables uh, second um, when you create the um, instance object. You know. OLS stands for ordinary least squares. So least squares is what we're doing when we do linear regression. Um, um, it's a description of the, the, the fit. Um, 
Um, but if you did that correctly, you should find in this case for our um, linear regression data for the first problem that you will get exactly the same fit that you did. Um, so, um, so it may not be obvious unless you kind of learn to uh, read, for example, the summary here, but um, um, in this particular case, you know, the important ones are these. So, so the, the, the constant coefficient um, should be exactly the same as what we got previously when we use scikit-learn to do our linear regression and the um, 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 X1 is our slope. So that's the, that's the coefficient for the, um, uh, the, the, the that, that's the slope or, or the term for our one and only coefficient, and that's the intercept. So, so that's the value. Um, 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 uh, for our bias term here, right? And I kind of skipped over it, but um, um, uh, uh, this will make more sense after the, the next week or two. Um, but um, we actually have to add in by hand um, a bias term here. So I talked about that a little bit last week. Um, um, Some of these other things have to do with evaluating how well the, the, the linear regression model fit the data, right? So again, it would help if you take a statistics course. Um, some of the important things are actually still down here. Um, I mean, you know, we've got our R squared score, so that should be the same as the R squared that we had on all the data above. Um, but uh, these here, this basically gives a p-value, um, and you know the thing to look for here is that um, um, if the p-value is bigger than like 0 0.05, in this case it was all very small. In fact, it was it was close to zero. We couldn't see the p-value. Um, but um, if the p-value is 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 large, so often 0 0.05 is used as a cutoff. That's an indication that um, the data isn't fitting very well. Um, um, uh, for this linear model here. So it might not be a linear relationship, or there might be other issues, lots of noise or whatever. And this is a confidence interval here. So, so this is um, uh, the, the, the 25, or uh, it's actually the 95% um, uh, confidence interval. So we have a confidence that the uh, true value of the intercept term is somewhere between negative 0.53 and negative uh, 2.46. You know, so with 95% confidence, the true value is probably somewhere in that range here. Um, again, this comes from statistical analysis of the um, um, kind of information that we can make, um, that we can make a statement about the confidence interval, interval of the true value just from the data and fitting uh, the data alone here. So. Likewise, you know, the, the true value of the, the slope uh, or, you know, this coefficient here, you know, which we determined was one, you know, was $1,193 profit for every 10,000 change in population. But that true slope is probably somewhere between $1,035 and $1,351, right? We're 95% confident um, that the profit is somewhere in that range, right? given the state that we have here. Um, all right, so yeah, I discussed some of that here. Any questions on that stuff? Um, Okay, and then the second part was to do kind of a similar thing, but to do a logistic regression um, on uh, a different data set. Um, somebody said, um, um, I don't know if I had somewhere, oops, I don't know if I had somewhere where I gave the wrong um, name for the file. If I did, I'm sorry about that. I, I meant to search through that here, but, but yeah, so, so we, should have been, we should have been using the assigned to exam data here.
not certain, but um, so, um, I discussed this a little bit uh, last week. Um, so in this case, um, um, so this is a classification problem. So what we're trying to predict is uh, a class or a category, so admitted or not admitted. Um, and by convention for a binary classification task where we only have a, a class with two values, we use zero for the, uh, the the false or the negative case, so not admitted. So, so zero should mean not admitted here. And we use one for the positive case, uh, which should mean admitted um, for this data, right? So if, if we were doing a binary classification for um, like a spam classifier, we would usually label the things that are spam would be the positive case. So the ones would be for things that were spam in our data set and the zero would be things that were not spam. So on, right? Although you can always flip those. So that's just kind of an arbitrary convention, but um, that's what people usually do here. So in this case though, we've got two, um, well, we've got three columns in the data, so two of them are actually going to be our in, um, um, independent variables, and then the, the uh, admitted um, is our dependent variable. And there's exactly 100 um, items of data in this data set here. Um, so what I was looking for on the plot was to, again, this is a little bit of, of practice doing matplotlib. Um, or, or plotting in general. So you could also do this with um, um, Seaborn, and there's probably other ways you could have done that. Uh, other ways using matplotlib or other plotting libraries. But the basics is that uh, I wanted the, the scatter plot of the data. I wanted, the, in this case, the two um, independent variables, which are the two exam scores. So every one of these points represents the two exam scores for one student um, that we have data for. Um, and then use some sort of indication um, for the category. So in this case, um, I'm showing an example of using both marker color, so red and blue, and marker shape. Um, um, so I use two different things. Um, so the red X's were the, the ones or the admitteds here. But so, I mean, in general, you can kind of see that there's a decision boundary somewhere approximately here. Uh, where people who have the two exam scores ab above and to the right of that decision boundary were generally admitted to this college and people that, that had um, scores below and to the left of that decision boundary were generally not admitted. Um, So using Seaborn, you can just directly um, give it um, um, you can just directly give it like a pandas data frame, for example, um, and you can tell it which columns or which features to use for the X and Y, and then you can say style and hue to um, uh, use those columns in order to pick the uh, marker type. So marker shape comes from style. In this case, we're using the, 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 the category, the, the label uh, for both of these. So, so we're styling them using um, admitted or not admitted, and we're coloring them using admitted or not admitted. Um, so, to fit the logistic regression using scikit-learn should look pretty similar. Um, so, um, oh yeah. So, um, I mean, when when we do a basic linear, oh, sorry, a basic logistic regression, um, it will create a linear decision boundary by default. You know, um, um, or you know, if this data is more than than. Um, um, two uh, uh, features that we're trying to make a model of, you have a plane, but still it's going to be like a, a linear uh, decision boundary or a hyperplane decision boundary, right? Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, you know, is a linear decision boundary justified here? I mean, it looks like it might be, I mean, probably we would get, if we could have some sort of a nonlinear uh, classifier, um, because it does look like to me, maybe that it's a little bit nonlinear here. There's a bias um, that um, people that did really well on one exam, but, but, um, Kind of tanked on one. So if you tanked on one of them, uh, even even if you did well on it, um, um, you had to do at least kind of some minimal on both exams um, to um, get admitted here. Yeah. Um, So I actually did something that I didn't expect lots of people will do here. So, so if you just do it, uh, you'll get slightly different than what I show here if you do it without um, specifying any metaparameters here. Let me just show that real quickly here. So, um, so oops. So by default, it uses a, uh, a um, what's known as a, um, and, and we'll talk about this, so, so what's known as a, um, 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 uh, not a, not a penalty, but um, um, uh, what's called regularization um, uh, here. But this basically adds something to penalize waste, and we'll talk about this kind of stuff here. So, so if you do it without, or if you, by, by default, it does have some regularization here. Um, but uh, by default, I think the, the stats model doesn't have any regularization. So you'll get different results if you use the default for scikit-learn versus the default for um, stats model. So, um, uh, So if you don't specify anything, and instead of getting exactly those values, um, Maybe rerun those things. Maybe have that backwards from what I'm describing it. So, um, so yeah, if we don't, um, we just use the completely the defaults for the logistic regression. Um, oh yeah, we still get the same thing. So, so maybe I've got that backwards there. Um, so let, let's go on here. So. Um, So you should have got something close to what I had here. Maybe not exact, but um, 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 oh yeah. So, so I think yeah, by default it doesn't have any regularization for scikit learn, but um, it uses some regularization for stats model, which maybe I show that later on here. I can't remember. Uh, we'll get we'll come up to that. So so you probably should have gotten something like this. I think um, if you didn't um, um, specify anything, if you just used the defaults for logistic regression. So, so again, uh, these represent, um, you can think of these as the, the coefficients um, uh, for our two features, x1 and x2, that are exam one and exam two uh, here, so 0.2053, and then this as a bias or intercept term here. Um, now this, so I talked a little bit about this. I, this, this I'm expecting would probably be the, the toughest thing to do here to to, to show the resulting um, um, decision boundary. Um, um, so I only went into this briefly last time. So we'll see how many people got this. Uh, and again, this is another something that will make a lot more sense uh, once we talk about logistic regression and decision boundaries and things. But but in this case, again, the coefficients. 
and the intercept represent the equation of a line, um, but uh, in this case, we have to use um, a formula, something like this. Um, 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 where think of it as the equation of a line where we have um, the, the value for x and y, or, or in this case, we'll call it uh, x1. Uh, I called it um, – I didn't call it anything here, but, um, but, but basically um, it's, it's the equation for a line um, where um, we've, we've set the values equal to, to zero, basically. So, you know, so it's, it's basically uh, 0 0.2053 times x. So, so we would normally have called like this axis the x axis and this axis the y axis. So that times x plus the other one, 0 0.200583. It's pretty similar, so it's a little bit tough to see, but um, which ones I'm doing differently here. Um, so that minus that equals zero, or um, equivalently, uh, that that coefficient times x plus that coefficient times y, or that coefficient times exam one values plus that coefficient times exam two values uh, equals. Um, like 0.5.05219 here, right? So, so that gives us the equation of a line in a slightly different form, right? So that's basically what I'm showing here. So the um, um, decision boundary, so, so our x values, uh, I, I create x values that just range from 30 to 100 um, linearly spaced. So by default, um, you know, the Make sure everybody understands what's happening here. Um, so, um, that's just an array of values from 30 to 100, uh, or linear, uh, linearly spaced. So, there's, you know, whatever, 50 values in there, or whatever the default is. Um, or, um, uh, yeah, so by default, it creates an array of, of 50 linearly spaced values between the begin and end um, that you have there. Um, so to, fish, to, to find out the um, values for the decision boundary in order to plot this line, um, I mean, basically we need to kind of solve for y up here. Right. So um, in this case, you know, we, we've got uh, 0 0.200583 times y equals uh, 25.05219 minus the other one, bringing x over to the other side. Right. And then if we divide uh, by the, the, the coefficient for the, uh, the y term, uh, we can solve for y to get um, so we can plot this out. So it's going to be, you know, the 25.05219 divided by the point zero, you know, the, the coefficient for the uh, exam two or the y. And then the, these two. So that, that's all that I'm showing here, right? So, um, um, oh, so, so yeah, it's just the, the um, all I'm showing right here in this calculation is um, that we're just using
the, um, the intercept um, uh, plus uh, the, the coefficient for the x times our um, decision boundary x values, um, all that divided by the other coefficient. Right. Um, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that should be positive because I've actually got the negative here. So I actually pulled out um, uh, the negative out here to make it negative and that plus that. Um, well, you see, that's that's the same kind of thing here. So, um, in any case, I mean, all, all that does though. So again, this is just an expression. So if uh, it, it, we can use vectorized calculations, then to just uh, put in our values of x here, and that that will give the corresponding values of y, which will then give us the decision boundary, which is what we're plotting here. Right. So, so all we're doing is, is plugging those in. Uh, and and we, we plug in a set of values of x that range from 30 to 100, all right? And then the result will be, you know, of this will be a, the vectorized calculation giving me the, the, the corresponding values of y that these coefficients um, and intercept term um, um, correspond to um, for our fitted uh, decision boundary here, right? So anyway, if you do that uh, for these particular values of the coefficients and intercept, you should have had a line that looks something like this, All right? But you can see, you know, we'll talk more about this. Um, um, so it is dividing the, the space um, um, effectively um, in anything on one side um, of this decision boundary, we would pr predict as a one or admitted anything on the other side as a zero. So it's not going to be a make perfect decision. So it's going to get a few things wrong for the existing ones. But you know, if we saw a new exam score, you know, like here, it, it would predict that the student would get admitted. And so it might be wrong for some things that are kind of close here, but uh, but it'll be right for things that are kind of um, about in this range or out in this range. Um, okay, uh, and then the rest, I don't know if anybody had any questions about these. Um, um, I did um, ask for a few other things like the confusion matrix. So again, uh, for the confusion matrix, you have to um, Basically, a confusion matrix is a um, um, showing um, what the uh, what what the, the 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 relationship between what your model is predicting versus what the true value was. Okay, so in this case, uh, again, we're not doing any training test split. We're we're just uh, comparing um, um, our our predictions from the model to what the what the actual values was. So so again, you can see where we're going to get some things wrong. So so some of these, um, so so the things below here, um, if we're using this as our decision boundary, these are going to be uh, we're we're predicting um, uh, we're going to predict a zero when it's actually a one. So we're going to predict a um, um, not admitted when it's admitted, right? So that's an example of a. Um, of a uh, false positive. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, um, so we're, we're going to be predicting a negative. So, this is going to be a false negative, right? So, so we would end up predicting uh, not admitted um, when the true value was admitted. So, we get a false negative here. And then things over here would be the, the, the false positives. Um, so, um, so, we're going to be predicting um, a positive, but we were. We were incorrect about this, so we, we falsely predict a positive right, for these values here that were on this side of the decision boundary. Right? 
And that's what the, the, the off diagonals are. So it's, uh, those will be your um, false positives and false negatives. And then these will be your like true positives, true negatives and true positives um, on your on diagonal. So we're getting like um, 89 correct and 11 incorrect, looking at the, the, the two things here, which looks about right. And so if we count up all of our ones that are on the wrong side of the decision boundary, it's probably about 11. Should be exactly eleven of those, although it might be tough to determine whether that one was incorrect or not, whether that was on the good or bad side of the decision boundary, for example. But all the rest of them we can determine. 